Welcome to the Rialto Marketing Podcast. Today's episode is a revenue acceleration series interview where we talk to seven-figure B2B professional service firm owners that are actively trying to grow their business and get to the next level. We talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly so that you can learn from their experience. Hi, I am Tim Fitzpatrick with Rialto Marketing. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in. I am super excited to have Jason Dittman from MicroAge with me today. Jason, welcome and thanks for being here. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward to digging into this with you. Um, before we jump into the heart of the uh, the conversation here, I want to ask you a few rapid fire questions. Are you ready to, to jump in with both feet? Let's go. Okay. Very quickly, what do you do? How long have you been doing it? So I'm the uh, the owner of MicroAge Regina, uh, president and owner. Uh, my wife and I have owned the business for seven years, and uh, I've been part of the company for 24 in the IT services uh, realm. It's a long time, man. <laughs> it's a long time. Uh, so what's what's the most important lesson you've learned in those those? Seven years or, or, or the 24, where do you want to pull it from? <laughs> certainly a, a combination of both, but certainly from a business owner perspective, just learning from those that have, that are, that are doing it, uh, surround yourself with a good peer group and, and learn from their successes as well as their opportunities to learn. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll, uh, I, I've avoided a lot of, a lot of problem and, and created a lot of, uh, great opportunity. Yeah, that's a fantastic piece of advice, right? There's so many people out there that we can learn from that have already gone down the path and why make the same mistakes they did. Uh, I, you know, early on, uh, my first business I was a partner in was a wholesale distribution company. And I, I owned it with my dad and some other partners. And we ended up partnering with other distributors across the country. And um, we were business partners, but we it was also very much like a mastermind and a peer group because some of the distributors were much further along, some were not, some were grouped in the middle. And every time we got together and we shared things, there were learning lessons and things to pull apart, right? We were greater as a whole than we were individually. And so yeah, um, I love that. <clears throat> So we we all know growing a business is hard, man. And it, certainly in 24 years, you've seen a lot of different ups and downs. It, do you have any kind of mantra or motivational saying that you say to yourself or you share with your team to push through those challenging times? That we're all better together. You know, yeah. sometimes we think we need to put our head down and push through. And there have been times, you know, obviously over the last challenging two or three years that I thought that you know, it's better if I push through myself. But the, the reality is if we work together collectively, we're always better than the, the, the sum of our parts, so to speak. So, yeah. Cool. I love it. So in the pre-interview, you had mentioned that you, you didn't actually start um, MicroAge. You've been there for, for 24 years, but you're now the owner. Um, can you share that journey with us a little bit? Absolutely. So it, it was very interesting. The owner at the, when I first started, I started in January of 2000, uh, interesting time in technology. And probably within the first couple of years, um, I had told the owner at the time, she kind of asked, well, what's your plan? And it's like, you know, I'd like to stay here a few years, learn the business and probably start my own firm up, right? <laughs> Just being honest. And, you know, the reality was that we had a great ownership group, Learned a lot, had a lot, a lot of opportunities to learn, and and I progressed through the organization, and and it, it was it was good people, right? We had great a great team, and as we progressed, and as our business kind of changed and evolved over the years, I got to be involved with that, and, and so instead of reinventing a wheel, I'm already in a wheel, and you know as as the conversation uh, of the owners, you know, started to progress that they're ready to move on and retire then I was able to kind of jump in and, you know, put my hand up to say, you know, now I'm ready to start that ownership journey. So I, I, I guess I had, you know, a real interesting opportunity to kind of learn the ropes and maybe kind of quasi start my own business yes. without the risk of starting my own business. So, uh, so that was, that was great. Um, and then, you know, certainly 
our business has evolved over the years from more of a value added reseller to an MSP and certainly had a lot of uh, change and growth there. But it uh, it was it, it it was very interesting. And as we kind of you know, go through the transition of you know being the employee to being the owner, certainly you know that opened up a lot of um, interesting conversations with with existing staff that you know, looked at me as a peer and then, and now, you know, kind of the owner of the organization. So yeah. there was, a, you know, a lot of different pieces that we had to work through in terms of, uh, you know, long tenured staff that may have had maybe a little bit more allegiance to the previous owners, yeah. um, bringing in my, you know, some new, some new leaders from, you know, who I felt I needed to help support the business grow. So, you know, there's some change and certainly some change management. So it's not, you know, <laughs> just because you have a, you know, a successful business, that transition can be a little tricky. Uh, so you have to be ready for it. And, you know, yeah. thankfully, like I said, I, I, I've, uh, I spoke to a lot of people in that pre-planning period. So kind of had my ducks in a row for what to expect and it didn't all kind of come to fruition. And obviously some, some different challenges popped their heads up too, but, it was uh, it was a, an interesting adventure, but you know, seven years later, we're in a real good spot. And m now we we were talking just briefly before we started recording. Microage, um, they're kind of individually owned franchise businesses, if you will. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. Yeah. And how long um, has the company always been Microage, or? Did they shift to the microage, you know, platform methodology at a certain point while you were were with the company? So we've always been a microage. So we've been okay. around as a microage in our market since 1991. Okay. Um, so yeah, long long history in our market. Yeah. Uh, so it's been we, a really long time. Yeah. The, the franchise organization in Canada started in I believe 1981. So long long uh, long standing. Uh, organization representing IT in, in Canada, for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, one of the other things that we talked about in the pre-interview that I thought was really interesting was, you know, you guys are big on digital risk management. Um, why do you call it, why do you call it this and why do you lead with it in your marketing and your sales efforts? You know, uh, five, 10 years ago, we used to fix computers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we used yeah. to back up data, um, we used to, you know, make sure people's productivity wasn't affected. Um, today's day and age, you know, certainly over the last, you know, five to eight years, the cybersecurity threat landscape has evolved so much to where it is today that it's no longer, it's, you know, still, you know, making sure users are productive with technology, but the risks to organizations is far beyond uh, employee productivity. It's it is about protecting the the, the data. It's about making sure that um, you know sh should data get compromised and 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 uh, uh, locked up by um, by ransomware that we have the proper plan to get the organization back up and running and you know mediate or mitigate any of those any of those risks or dangers to the organization um, because. You know, if you don't have the right recovery plan, then we're looking at, you know, some real financial risk, financial liability, you know, to, to hopefully get the data back. And so really looking at what is the what is the greater risk to organizations? Is it, a, a, you know, a desktop or laptop crashing or is it, you know, a, a threat actor getting into the network and getting the financial information, the customer information or credit card yeah. information? Um, I think that's the bigger risk. So you know, really the, the shift for me and, and, and our team is really looking at it from a digital risk perspective. Certainly, you know, you need to have that great customer service looking after the, the people day to day. That's becoming, you know, everyday stuff. Everyone should be doing that. Yeah. Uh, but on top, we really need to make sure that we're protecting a clients from a, from a digital perspective to make sure that, you know, they're not going to have the, the pain uh, of, of having to go through an experience like that. So when you talk about dis digital risk management, Jason, essentially you're talking about cybersecurity. Is that that's right? Correct. Yeah, that's correct. Um, which, look, I think most of us have heard of cybersecurity at this point. Um, but kind of for most of us, it's probably more like black magic. You know, <laughs> it doesn't really mean a whole lot. 
And so rather than leading with cybersecurity, you guys are talking about it as digital risk management, which to me, from a marketing perspective, you're just positioning it differently than how a lot of people talk about it, but you're also positioning it in a way that your ideal clients are going to better, that it's going to resonate better with them uh, and, and have more meaning to them. Is that what you have found when you talk about it as digital risk management versus cybersecurity? 100%. And that, that's a really key point. Um, you know, the things that we do are, are valuable to people that value their data. And the reality is if, if people do not have valuable data or valuable IT process, then you know protecting it from a digital risk perspective isn't important, right? People yeah. that have assets that they don't doesn't really matter to them. They're not going to necessarily get the top level of insurance to protect it because if it goes away, nah, we can still continue on, and and that's reality for some businesses. But for really our target customers are the ones that have a high value of technology, a high value of productivity. So we want to talk at that next level because you know cybersecurity you know, protection in our industry, that's, that's table stakes. Everyone is doing, yeah. you yeah. know, the, the core pieces. We need to take that next level of just making sure, do we have an incident response plan? Do we have some of these other pieces, you know, in place so that we can really make sure that we've upped, you know, our client's game. And uh, so when they, you know, if, if an event were to occur that you were able to kind of get things up and running in, in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Well, and it's like you said, a lot of this stuff is is table stakes, not only in the, you know, in the managed service provider industry, but just in most industries, there are things that are table stakes that people expect, yet most businesses in that industry are talking about it the same way. And when that happens, they end up having a really hard time differentiating and creating a competitive advantage. And although you're talking about cybersecurity, the way you guys have positioned it you're talking about it differently. It's it's resonating with your market better, but it's but it's also positioned as different, which helps start to create this competitive advantage, which I love, and which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to talk about it a little bit. Because you know, especially in managed service, managed services, it's like, man, nobody bu nobody loves buying IT. They don't buy IT. <laughs> They're buying solutions to business problems, right? And they're buying business outcomes. They're not buying IT to buy IT. They're buying IT for what business outcome it can get them. Right. Right. And so I, I love how you guys have done that because I think it's it's different than how a lot of what a lot of people do in the space. Um so we already you already kind of touched on about seven years ago you bought the business. Um, and I when I'm talking to people that have that have bought the business. I always like to ask this question because um, I think there's a lot of learning lessons from it. But when you initially bought the business, what did you focus on initially and, and why did you do that? I, I initially focused on relationships, uh, internal relationships, and just making sure that people knew, you know, my vision of what we're up to, <laughs> that there wasn't, you know, I was as, as clear and honest as I could be with everybody. Yeah. Um, just so that they didn't think I was coming in with my own, you know, completely radical agenda to do all these different things is, you know, just, just talking to people about really where I want to take things yeah. and, uh, and, and, and then got their feedback on how, how the heck we're going to do it. So uh, I think that was, that was some of the important parts. Um, and then really focused on uh, trying to set up, some like um some management process um you know one of the things we did really early on is we adopted the traction methodology and that really yep. <laughs> really helped us out uh, getting ourselves a little bit more organized so th those are two of the main things in, within the first uh you know definitely relationships and, and having those conversations yeah so i want to pull a few things out here um one I love that when most people buy businesses, they are talking about like, hey, this is this this is what our plans are, right? We there's a lot of unknowns, right? People on the team are are not sure, they're uncomfortable. But one of the things you said was we we asked for feedback, right? You brought them in to some of those decisions, right? Rather than hey, this is what we're doing. If you're on board, cool. If you're not, freaking jump ship. 
Um, and my guess is that helped people buy in to the process a little bit more. And then from there, it's, you know, or did you do what you say you were going to do? Right. Um, but I love the fact that you asked for feedback. And the other thing too, when you talk about traction, um, for those people that are not familiar with it, uh, traction is the book EOS or the entrepreneurial operating system is the, the company itself. And, uh, Certainly, it's very prevalent all over the place. In the MSP space, there are a lot of people that uh, have latched on to EOS. So um, it's a very good system. Um, and so you guys, have, you guys have been on that, well, for, for seven years now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. I love it. Um, so what, what are the biggest things holding you back from getting where you want to be? Um, you know, it's... Sales and marketing is always a moving target. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you think you have it dialed in, uh, things change. You know, algorithms yeah. change, uh, consumer behaviors on social media change. Um, it's it's such a moving target. When you know, we we try to get the right messaging out, and you know, from our, our sales team and in, in going out to some of the meeting ones, and you know, what was important and impactful last year isn't as important. So it's always just trying to find, you know, the right talking points, the right value propositions when we're talking to our prospects uh, to, you know, to kind of acquire net new clients and, and, and always making sure that we have the right balance because we could spend, you know, millions and millions of dollars yes. on cybersecurity, but, you know, we have to find that right balance of security and, and, uh, fiscal, you know, fiscally responsible budgeting for our clients. So, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> we're in a, we're in an industry that has a lot of different moving, moving targets and we have to really balance a lot of, uh, a lot of spin and plates. So, yeah. I, so let's dig into sales and marketing being a moving target. Cause, uh, th this is not, you're, you're obviously, you're not alone in this challenge, right? Um, it's, Gosh, a lot of people, a lot of businesses just try it and they just stop because they're like, "This, I'm, I can't do this, right? It's not working. I'm trying all these different things. And I, I think this is appropriate to multiple aspects of business, but especially with, with marketing, especially um, the, the tactics, the, the channels, the marketing vehicles that we use are evolving very quickly. Like you said, I mean, there's there's new social channels coming up. There's algorithm changes. There's you know, SEOs changing, right? There's AI now. It's like, how do you stay on top of all this? And the thing that I always come back to with marketing is the fundamentals, right? The principles of marketing, the strategy behind it, because those things don't change in any discipline, right? The fundamentals of standing up and hitting a major league fastball, right? Or, you know, we had, we talked about the jerseys behind you in our pre-interview, you know, like you're in Canada, right? The, the, the fundamentals of, of hockey, right? Skating, you know, hitting the puck, passing, right? There are fundamentals there that doesn't matter whether you're a professional or you're just starting out, you've got to master those fundamentals. And so with things that are changing and very dynamic, like marketing, I think it is that much more important to master the fundamentals because if you've got the fundamentals in place, as things change, those fundamentals lay the foundation. And so the tactics are going to shift, but the fundamentals that drive those tactics are never changing. And, and so making sure that when we jump into our marketing vehicles, we've got that strategy in place behind it is what makes the the road and the path smoother, right? It's still it's still going to be bumpy. Plenty of marketing and plenty of sales tactics we try are not going to work. That's part of the process. But when we've got the fuel, we can we're still going to get to the destination, right? It's we may have to make a few turns that were unanticipated, but we're still going to yeah. get there. Yeah. Um, because and that's another thing is with marketing, it's it's information overload. Right. And when there's so much information out there, that's another reason why it's so important to have that foundation, have a plan, 
so that we can be disciplined enough to not get distracted because it's very easy to get distracted and go, oh, I'm going to follow that one. <laughs> you know, oh, this is the best, newest, shiny clubhouse is a perfect example. Clubhouse was super popular during the pandemic. And I haven't heard anybody say anything about Clubhouse in, in at least two years. So, you know, the the, the marketing tactics are going to change, but the, the fundamentals behind it won't. Um, so hopefully people that are that are listening find that helpful because it's uh, it is a moving target and you're ne you're never done. It's not like you've conquered the marketing hill and you're like, I got it. Everything's <laughs> peaches and cream. Right. Because once you get over that that first hill, then, you know, you may go down a little bit and you got to climb another hill. You're, it's yeah. you're never done. Constant process. So. Looking back at your microage experience, what are the what are the top two to three things that that instantly stand out for you? Uh, you know, I think understanding. So, like, kind of looking at our evolution. You know, right around 2012 was a real big inflection point for our business. We were primarily a, a VAR, a hardware related business. Probably 80 to 90 percent of our revenue was was hardware based, but they, wow. you know, it was okay. increased competition. It was increased, uh, decreased margins and, uh, and de decreased, you know, gross dollars. And we had to, we had to shift and we had to really, you know, be disciplined to say, we need to, we need to grab a whole new base of clients. You know, we, we were fortunate. We had some that we were doing it services for, but we had to adopt the MSP model yeah. and it was really difficult. We, had, you know, some texts didn't fit the way we needed to, to do services. The sales team didn't do sales the way that we needed them to. So we had like, like a massive shift from 2012 to 14 uh, in our business because we, 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 we saw the writing was on the wall. And, but had we not had the discipline to say we need to foundationally change, we would we we may we may not have been here. Yeah. So uh, that's that was the reality. Um, but we successfully made the transition. But it, it did take, you know, a yeoman's yeoman's effort in terms of changing <laughs> changing the mindset and changing, you know, people's uh, you know well changing some people that didn't fit. Uh, and you know, a lot of people you know, voluntarily said this isn't the right direction, and and others would say, "Hey, this is great, let's go." So, luckily, you know, by the time I was ready to buy in 2017, you know, most of that uh, fundamental shift had had kind of taken place. But there were just so many you know components that just allowed us, and and maybe maybe another point when we made that shift, there was just so many pieces of technology that were ready for small medium business. Offsite backup became uh, reasonably priced. Microsoft 365 was in its infancy, but it was, it, you know, allowed people to get enterprise exchange email, right? So we were able to really offer a whole new value proposition to uh, a market that really hadn't had access to it. So that was the one real exciting part of that whole transition is that we could unlock an entire um, portfolio of technology solutions uh, to clients that wouldn't have had access to it. In, right. in, a, in a safe and secure way. So we we're really excited about, about that transition, but it certainly was, uh, it was, it was scary. <laughs> well, you know, it's um, this example really points out the, especially in business, but I think in life in general, being open to change and embracing it, like it's going to happen whether we want it to or not. And you guys saw this starting to happen and rather than fight it, you embraced it. Yeah, you know, perfect example is is Blockbuster and Netflix, right? Blockbuster, I mean, geez, I, it's not maybe maybe it's not the biggest <laughs> business failure, but it's a pretty damn big one. I mean, they owned a huge section of a market, but they did not adapt to the changes in the market. They refused to really, and if they had, what? Who knows what would have happened with Netflix, right? right. And so it's, uh, man, we can fight change, but it's not going to serve us at all. And and because you were willing to adapt 
and accept it early on, it gave you that much more time to transition, right? And get ahead of the curve rather than be behind it. Um, But two, I mean, your business going from 90% hardware sales, shifting to MSP services, like you said, it's a lot of work, a lot of changes that had to happen in the business, but long-term you're getting recurring revenue. You have higher profit margins. Um, those are all good things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, had we, <clears throat> had we done the same type of business through COVID, it would have been massively different. You know, uh, a lot of our clients very much relied on the technology services we provided. And, and, yeah. you know, from a, um, uh, recurring revenue perspective, those, you know, those are the things that, that really allow us to have some stability in our business and predictability. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, well, with product sales, it, when everybody else is buying the same products and selling them, you know, there's always, there's always price compression in the market and yeah. that's, it's just a really tough place to be. So, uh, yeah. kudos for, for being open to the transition. So one last question, Jason, before we wrap things up, which is knowing what you know now, is there anything you would do differently? I think, you know, really, I had a lot of pieces of the puzzle put together. Um, Honestly, I think I would have wanted to do more research around different financing options when I did buy. And if there are any, any employees that want to buy the business, like look at some different options. Um, and just and just understand how it all works. I, at, at the end of the day, it all worked out great. Um, but uh, just know know that part of of you know you, you may know the business, you may you know really have a good plan to 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 do the business. But uh, bankers sometimes you know have a, a another another thought process yeah. as well. So did you have did you have any other advisors? That were helping you through the purchase process. I had some uh, some uh, one one specific owner in uh, of uh, one of the other microage franchises that I leaned on, and uh, and and certainly yeah, a legal counsel as yeah. well. So. It's you know, um, man, I have made this mistake multiple times. Uh, I think many of us have, where it's like, man, if we're getting into something. And we don't have prior experience like, man, we are so much better off hiring somebody to help advise and guide us through that process that has that experience because they bring visibility to the blind spots that we have. They can help us avoid missteps, get through the process more efficiently with less pain. Um, but gosh, sometimes we just fight that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, um, but like I said, I have made that mistake myself, <laughs> and uh, I like, why? There's no reason for us to go through that kind of stuff. We just yeah. need to be open. Well, and you know, look, it's going to cost money to get that advice in most cases, um, but a lot of the times you can end up making mistakes that cost you far more than paying for the advice. So, um, Jason, fantastic man! I appreciate you taking the time. Great stuff. Where can people learn more about you if they want to connect? So I'm on LinkedIn under uh, Jason Dittman on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly our, our website, microage.ca slash Regina is our, our homepage. Lots of information about what what and how we do. And and certainly I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So uh, give me a follow and, and check out some of my video content that, that I offer as well. Cool. I love it. We'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. So if you guys want to connect with Jason, please do so. Um, I have enjoyed chatting with you now twice. So thank you for that time. Those of you that are watching and listening, thank you. I appreciate you. And if you want to connect with us, you can do that over at rialtomarketing.com. We talked about a lot of different things in Jason's experience about, you know, growing microage. If you want to know which of the nine revenue roadblocks might be slowing down your growth, you can do that over at revenueroadblockscorecard.com. Takes less than five minutes. Customized report. There's a ton of valuable info there. So go take advantage of that. And uh, until next time, take care. 